Let us pray. O God, author and giver of all good things, plant in our hearts the love of your name, increase in us true religion, nourish us with all goodness, and bring forth in us the fruit of good works. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let everyone who is thirsty come. Let those who wish take the water of life as a gift. The grace of God flows freely here. In penitence and faith, let us confess our sin. Almighty and merciful God, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Forgive those who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent according to your promises declared to the world in Jesus Christ our Lord and grant, O merciful God, for his sake, that we may live a holy, just, and humble life to the glory of your holy name. Whatever you have done, whatever you have failed to do, whoever you are, 
whoever you wish you were but are not, you are accepted, you are welcomed, you are washed clean, you are raised up, you are forgiven, you are set free. In the love of Jesus Christ, you are loved forever. The scripture readings will come from the homes of church members. Let us seek God's spirit to illumine the reading and the preaching of God's word. God, our helper, by your Holy Spirit, open our minds that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may be led into your truth and taught your will for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. Hear what the Spirit says to the church. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see... God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt." But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me what is his name, what shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. Sing to the Lord and remember the marvels he has done. Alleluia. Sing to the Lord and Speak of all his marvelous works, 
glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Search for the Lord and his strength. Continually seek his face. Remember the marvels he has done. His wonders and the judgments of his mouth. O offspring of Abraham, his servant. O children of Jacob, his chosen. God remembered his holy word and let forth his people with gladness. Alleluia. God remembered his holy word and let forth his people with gladness. Alleluia. Israel came into Egypt, and Jacob became a sojourner in the land of Ham. The Lord made his people exceedingly fruitful. He made them stronger than their enemies whose heart he turned so that they hated his people and dealt unjustly with his servants. He sent Moses his servant and Aaron whom he had chosen. reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. Hear what the Spirit says to the church. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. But leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink, for by doing this you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Holy Wisdom, Holy Word. Thanks be to God. Goodness is stronger than evil, love is 
from the gospel of according to Matthew here's what the spirit says to the church from that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised and Peter took him and began to rebuke him saying God forbid Lord this shall never happen to you but he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not on the side of God, but of men. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his life? Or what shall a man give in return for his life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of the Father, and then he will repay every man for what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Before moving to the farm, E.B. White lived and worked in New York City far away from that quiet barnyard he made so famous in Charlotte's Web. He wrote many essays for the New Yorker magazine about life in the big city, including one about an exchange between a mother and a child in a crowded store just before Christmas. Shopping at Woolworths in the turbulent days, we saw a little boy put his hand inquiringly on a ten-cent Christ child, part of a crash. What is this? he asked his mother, who had him by the hand. Come on, come on, replied the harassed woman. You don't want that. She dragged him grimly away. A Woolworths Madonna, her mind dark with gift thoughts, following a star of her own devising. You don't want that, meaning the Christ. What about us? Do we want the Christ? That's the question that confronts us in this passage from Matthew's Gospel. Matthew sets the scene, not just in terms of geography, but by the events he has been describing in the earlier chapters of his gospel. Jesus has been going about the countryside, casting out demons, healing the sick, challenging the rules and customs of the established religious authorities. He's even told people that their sins are forgiven. He has become so popular that he cannot go out in public without being besieged by throngs of rapt admirers and so controversial that the powers that be are keeping a close eye on him. 
The rumors about Jesus range from the sublime to the ridiculous. Some say he's John the Baptist, come back to life. Others that he's the ancient prophet Elijah, herald of the messianic age. Some see him as just the kind of charismatic leader who could rally the forces of revolution and throw off the yoke of Roman oppression. On their way between towns, heading toward the Hellenistic resort area known as Caesar's Philippi, Caesarea Philippi, Jesus asks his disciples, what they are hearing. Who do people say that I am, he asks. Cautiously, the disciples list the possibilities. John, Elijah, one of the prophets. Then Jesus raises the stakes. Who do you say that I am? Or a better translation for us would be, who do y'all say that I am? For it is in the second person plural that the question is asked. Matthew doesn't say if 11 of the disciples step back or if Peter stepped forward, but either way, he was speaking for them as well as for himself. When he squared his shoulders and looked Jesus straight in the eye and said, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. The Greek word for Messiah, you probably know, is Christ. And the term means anointed one or maybe chosen one. Peter is saying, You are the one. You are the one who is bringing in the age of God's new reign. It was a bold thing to say. It took chutzpah to say a thing like that, but Peter had good reasons for saying it. The electrifying teaching, the miracles, the way Jesus spoke with authority that seemed to come straight from God, I think the look on his face when he entered that house and saw that little girl lying on her deathbed. This was enough to convince Peter that if God's kingdom were going to arrive on earth at all, it would arrive with this man called Jesus. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah. It was the right answer, of course, and it still is. It's the answer most of us in this room or out there on the internet have staked our lives on. But do we know what it really means? What does it mean for Jesus to be Messiah? And wouldn't some other Messiah suit us better? We have choices, you know, or so we're told. Kenneth Woodward, the religion editor of Newsweek magazine, describes the world we're living in as an age of mixum matchum salad bar spirituality. There is no need to accept the default Messiah as described in the Gospels. We could opt for a customized version don't like what Jesus says about the greatest commandment? Well, substitute a few lines from some self-help guru. Embarrassed by Jesus' advice to the so-called rich young ruler to sell all that he possesses, give the money to the poor, and follow him? Well, mix that in with some practical wisdom from your financial planner. Find Jesus' style a bit too confrontational. Well, you could try a more tactful, loose-fitting cut of Messiah, one you'd be comfortable showing off to your friends. 
Urban Holmes, the pastor and writer, tells of a conversation he heard on an airplane flying from Minneapolis to Winnipeg. Behind him were seated a young man from a campus ministry group based in Dallas and an older Hindu man from India. The young man talked eagerly and at great length, quoting scripture freely as his trapped neighbor listened patiently all the way from Minneapolis to Winnipeg. At the end of the conversation, the Indian man said politely, Sir, I thought your Jesus lived long ago in Palestine. It strikes me that the man you have been describing to me is more like a civic-minded banker in Dallas. A banker, a New Age Zen motorcyclist, to mix and match your favorite features to create your own Messiah. It's the in thing to do, after all. But beware of the Messiah who bears the good news in the Gospels. This Messiah is different. This Messiah suffers. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Peter didn't know what to do with this description of messiahship any more than you or I do. It certainly didn't fit his expectations of a messiah and I think for many of us, it doesn't fit ours either. Peter took Jesus aside to have a private conversation. Master, we can almost hear him say, this will, will never do. Suffer, die, rise again. Surely all that's not really necessary. After all the miracles we've seen you perform, we know you can do better than that. Think of your public. Think of all the people you could still help. Think of your disciples. We're going to look pretty silly following a suffering Messiah. Look, you've been working night and day. Take a break. Relax. Send Judas into town for some takeout. Surely we can figure out a better way. Whatever Peter said, it evoked one of the strongest rebukes ever to come from the lips of Jesus. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Your mind isn't on what God wants. It's on what you want. Poor Peter, he was only saying what's on our minds too. We want a princely Messiah, a popular Messiah, an easy to like, easy to follow, easy to sell Messiah. We want a Messiah who looks very much like the people who star in movies or make commercials or hit home runs or win gold medals or occupy the White House. We want a successful Messiah, the kind who can win but cannot save. As I read Matthew's Gospel, Jesus knows by this time in his ministry that there's a kind of inevitability about his suffering and death. He must suffer, he says. Matthew uses a Greek verb that implies divine necessity. It's a must that Jesus chooses, I suppose, but it's also a must that God in some ways requires of him. 
It's a terrible choice Jesus makes to go to Jerusalem and to die on a cross and it's a terrible choice he offers us when he invites us to follow him. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. I don't know for sure what denying self, taking up the cross, following Jesus means for you, I can give you some preliminary conclusions for myself. For me to deny myself has something to do with putting my ego aside long enough to feel some of the hurt that I cause the very people I want to love. It means facing up to the disasters caused by my good intentions. It means looking for Jesus in the people who are not the winners, the movers, the shakers. It means refusing to accept the lie that the culture keeps telling me, the lie that I am what I own and I can only find happiness in what I consume. To deny myself is to accept that there is nothing I can do to make God love me more and nothing I can do to make God love me less. It's to deny the self that keeps trying to prove to God that I am worthy of God's grace and love. To take up my cross is to accept that there are some things that I cannot change and therefore with God's help I must endure. It means living with the brokenness of a broken world until God heals all that is broken. And what does it mean to follow Jesus? It is at least in part to accept that a faithful life is going to hurt. If like Jesus we are going to live fully human lives, if we are going to live in fidelity to him, following Jesus into places where he suffers, we are going to suffer too. You know, for the most part, we Christians in the United States live comfortable lives. Our government does not put us in prison for professing Jesus Christ as Lord. And despite the grumbling of some Christians, we are not victims of some nefarious conspiracy against the First Amendment to the Constitution. At least until the pandemic hit, we had it pretty good, you and I. But the past few months have brought not only some personal discomfort, but also exposed the genuine suffering of others, suffering we have managed to ignore for a very long time. It turns out that much of the prosperity we have attributed to our own virtue and hard work has been built on the backs of people of color. The white privilege that surrounds most of us like a bubble corrupts even our best intentions. Even when we face up to the centuries of racism from which we benefit daily, we don't know how to repair a breach so wide and so deep. To call that suffering is to overstate the case, but I do have the sense that in times like these, we are being called to confront uncomfortable truths 
about ourselves and the harm we inflict, however unwittingly, on the very neighbors God calls us to love. Like Peter, we don't want to go there. And there are plenty of fellow Christians right now who would prefer to live in an alternate reality. But we know deep down where Jesus would have us go. I know of a young woman who lives in Williamsburg, Virginia, and is very active in a Presbyterian church there. She dropped out of church life in her college years, but was, I suppose you could say, reconverted maybe by a single event, a question put to her by her small child. They were in a store that sells jewelry and her four-year-old spotted a, a crucifix. She pointed to the figure of Jesus hanging on that cross and said, Mommy, what is that man doing? What is that man doing? What's a nice Messiah like you doing on a cross like this? Who do you say that I am? We only discover the answer by living it, by following him. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess the faith of our baptism. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Grace and peace to you. My name is Matt Fries, and I am the newly called campus minister here at Ukirk, Tallahassee. I'm very excited about this new call as I believe it draws together the various elements of ministry that I find meaningful and exciting, as well as the places in which God is calling me to use the gifts and talents that I possess. In our ordination vows, we ask, will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love. My experience with college students is that these attributes are fully present and that the aim of this ministry and the work with these students is to engage those attributes in such a way as to deepen faith, as to widen experiences, and to create space that is safe and supportive to wrestle with the questions of faith and life. I hope in my ministry here at Ukirk to cultivate a space rich in energy and love, a space where intellectual curiosity is given room, a space where creative ways to engage issues of social justice, inclusion, and love of our neighbor are given expression. And I hope to center all of it within the worship of the triune God. 
In the next month or so, my family and I will be in the process of relocating to, from Atlanta. My spouse, Amy, and I have two boys, Jacob and Nicholas. Amy is a pharmacist and a ruling elder in our home church in Atlanta. And we are looking forward to this new chapter in our lives and getting settled here in Tallahassee and putting down roots. And once it is safe for us to join together and meet face to face, we look forward to getting to know each and every one of you and getting to know this congregation. Good morning, First Presbyterian Church family. Uh, today, those of you who are going back to school as a preschool or an elementary school or high school or middle school student um, received a blessing pack, which included, not this big, but a reminder to put on your backpack that your First Presbyterian Church family loves you and is praying for you, and a First Presbyterian face mask so that you remember that we want you to be safe and that our prayers go with you as you go back to school, whether that's um, virtually in your um, own home or uh, back at your school. So uh, you're being prayed for this morning, but we continue to pray for you as the school year um, continues for some of you and begins tomorrow for lots of you. Next week on September 6th, we are kicking off our new church school program and there'll be all sorts of information in the newsletter and there'll also be emails going um, to you about the various uh, different programs we have planned for the fall. Uh, just a reminder that our book group does meet on September 2nd at seven o'clock. Look forward to seeing lots of you there. If you have more uh, questions or you need more information or haven't gotten um, the information you need about classes coming up, you can email me, Christy at oldfirstchurch.org. Have a great day. Good morning. These prayers are offered for Sunday, August 30th. We offer our prayers for healing for Priscilla Harrison, Tara Reynolds, Terry Green, Jan O'Neill, Charles Freeman, Skip West, Peggy Mellinger, Dan Hughes, Rita, the mother of Ann Del Rossi, Deborah Keelty, Sabrina Wright, Karen, the daughter of Joan Custis, Gina Marvin, who is at Westminster Oaks Health Center recovering from a fall, Wayne Friedemann, currently at Capital Regional Medical Center, all who have been diagnosed with COVID-19. We offer our prayers for strength and mercy for Monique Ellsworth and the staff and volunteers of Second Harvest of the Big Bend, health care providers at our hospitals and urgent care centers and fire responders and first responders, Patricia McCoy Delancey, Thaddeus Gillen, Sarah Lamar, Myrna McGowan, Wilton Kane, Laura Lewis, daughter of Patsy Kicklider, Esteban Contreras and his family, Pastor Izette Sama Hernandez and the Presbyterian Church of Cuba, the Churches of the Presbytery of Florida, all those affected by Hurricane Laura, the Reverend Margaret Fox and her congregation. We also pray for those in military service, including Zach McGuff, Jonathan Babineau, Brian Gizau, Ross Yielding. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, you know our every need. Before the words leave our lips, you hear, and your spirit intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. As we pray, draw us closer to you and give us the grace we need to align our lives with your best hopes for the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our nation. As the election heats up, give us cool heads 
to discern what is good and what is true. Whatever our political passions remind us of the Christ in others and of the log that lodges in our own eye. No matter whom we support for president, keep us loyal to the one Lord whose love claims and makes us his own. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who are sick, for all who mourn, for all who are depressed or anxious, lonely or afraid. In every person, in every mind, in every circumstance, come, O Lord, with your healing and your grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the victims of recent storms. May they know you, your presence. May they receive the help they need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for students and teachers in our community, whether they teach and learn in person or online. Help them to grow in patience and knowledge and regard for one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now we thank you for all the saints who from their labors rest. Keep before us the promise of reunion in the life to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. To you, lover of the world, we commend those we love and those whose needs are known only to you. To you alone be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. It has been our custom through the years when we come to this portion of the Sunday just before school begins to invite all the teachers and learners in our congregation to gather here 
around the table so you must use your imagination and see yourselves gathered here as we pray for the beginning of school. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Gracious God, we thank you for all your blessings, and especially today for the opportunity to teach and learn. We thank you for teachers and students, for bus drivers and professors, for aides and coaches, and all who help to form us as those who would serve you with heart, soul, mind, and strength. As we begin this new and challenging school year, bless all who teach and learn, that all may grow in wisdom in stature, and in favor with you and their neighbors. Through Jesus Christ, our teacher, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you forever. Amen.